Well, good morning, everybody, um, and welcome to day two of our conference. I don't think there's any need for me to introduce uh, Dr. Bob Doyle, except to point out that there are several of him. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. You will meet the different versions of Bob um, as you go uh, around. So, he's um, going to talk to us about the two-stage solution to the problem of free will, which seems to me to be getting to the nitty gritty of what this conference is about. Oh. More gritty than nitty, I hope. <laughs> okay. When I went to Harvard in the 1950s to study astrophysics, the Big Bang Theory told us that the universe began in a state of equilibrium some 10 or 20 billion years ago. Given the second law of thermodynamics that I studied as an undergraduate at Brown, I asked, why are we still in equilibrium? What is the second law all about? Why do we have a cosmos rather than a chaos? Why something rather than nothing? Leibniz, great question. Then in the 1960s, I finished my PhD thesis on the interaction of two atoms, entangled, we would say today, colliding and absorbing photons of radiation. And my research taught me that the universe is, in fact, discrete, not continuous. It's extremely important. Quantum rather than classical, digital in today's computer terms rather than analog. I read Arthur Stanley Eddington, especially Nature of the Physical World, and he said that quantum mechanics had now shown that predetermination, predeterminism, the old idea, is simply not true. And like Eddington, I connected quantum physics to free will. Quantum randomness, I thought, generates new possibilities for the universe, just like they, it generates new possibilities for the evolution of biological species. Then in the 1970s, I got Dan Dennett's book called Brainstorms, in which he described a two-stage model for free will. First, a production stage, generating possibilities randomly, and then a subsequent choice stage. But Dennett thought only deterministic, pseudo-random number sequences like his computer models were needed to generate the alternative possibilities to be considered and evaluated later. At the time, I thought libertarians would soon accept this two-stage model. It had been obvious to me for a while. But of course, with indeterministic true quantum randomness to break the deterministic causal chain back to the origin of the universe. Unfortunately, that didn't quite happen. But Bob Kane, who's with us, today's leading libertarian, always has said quantum mechanics and quantum randomness is a key part of the solution. But he locates his indeterminism in decisions that are needed for his self-forming actions of character and moral responsibility that I cannot address. I'm into the technical side. Bob is into the importance and significance uh, into moral reasoning. Uh, but he said that Dennett's model was a significant piece in the overall puzzle, included it in his 1985 textbook, has always stressed it even in most recent books, that it's suitable for practical reasoning, reasoning if not moral. But given the randomly generated possibilities of the first stage of the model, an agent would be, quote, determined to choose the best available option. This is the major criticism I always get about my theory. Perhaps I say, but the agent would not be predetermined Okay, even from moments just before any new deliberations began, and certainly not from the beginning of the universe. Then in the 1990s, Al Mealy published a book uh, for modest libertarianism that is essentially the Dennett decision-making model, but Al remains agnostic on the importance of quantum mechanics. Indeed, his agnosticism extends to work that is of interest to both determinists and indeterminists. And he doesn't make a decision there, but he tries instead to advance the subject. He said, for him, you know, for him determinism might still be true. He says, it might be worth exploring the possibility of combining a compatibilist, he means determinist, conception of the later parts of the process with an incompatibilist or indeterminist conception of the earlier parts, which is the two-stage model, compatibilists may, in principle, be willing to accept an account of causation that accommodates both the deterministic and probabilistic components. That's great. That's the two-stage model. And I agree completely with Al. I hope he's right about compatibilists agreeing. But first, can we get some agreement among the philosophers who have written about this subject and with support from the scientists, OK? Does anyone know how I get the pointer with this thing, the little laser pointer? Uh, so then, in the 2000s, just last year, Martin Heisenberg 
Which button is it? Thank you very much. Um, in Nature, last May, a year ago, uh, he, Heisenberg argued for what we, he and I have agreed to call behavioral freedom. He went a little far talking about it being free will. Uh, based on a two-stage process of randomness followed by lawful behavior. He felt it could be the basis for free will in humans, and Antoine uh, charged me with explaining how you get from Martin to me. Well, I wrote to Nature, my first philosophical publication, to say that a two-stage model had been first suggested in 1884 by William James, the great psychologist and philosophy uh, <laughs> professor at Harvard. Since him, it was also discussed by Henri Poincaré, Arthur Holly Compton, Karl Popper, a really wonderful insight into it, Henry Marginow, John Martin Fisher, Stephen Kostlin, the Harvard psychologist mentioned earlier, and of course, Dennett, Kane, Mealy, and myself. And I'd like to argue that it is now the most practical and plausible model for a kind of free will process. So what is the model? In stage one, very simply, alternative possibilities are generated by chance, in part by quantum events that break the causal chain of determinism back to the beginning of the universe. Second stage, an adequately determined, and by that I want mean to limit determinism to a determination which will evaluate the alternatives and result in a willed decision. And I like to encapsulate that in these ideas. First, a spontaneous variation, <coughs> then a selection. This is what William James called it as he applied Darwin's biological evolution to mental evolution. Um, First chance, then choice. That was the first tight phrase I read. Henry Marginal. I like that one a lot. First possibilities, which compatibilists deny ever since Harry Frankfurt. Compatibilists say, no possibilities, only actualism. OK. I like this two-sentence version. Thoughts come to us freely. They pop into our heads. We all talk about that happening. It just seemed to come to us. Mozart's music flew into his mind, and he wrote it down. Actions, however, go from us willfully. I want to separate the free from the will, something John Locke first did in 1680s, because he said, surely it's not the will that is free or random. It's the person, the man, that's free. And to understand that, you must see free will is not a single concept, a moment of time. You must unpack it into a free stage and a will stage. OK. Dan Dennett, however, objects to this two-stage model. And as I mentioned, I'm in uh, Dan's free will seminar at Tufts at the moment this fall. Because he says, look, why can't I get by with random but deterministic, generated by a computer, pseudo-random numbers, aren't they good enough? And I say, no, we need the quantum randomness primarily to break the causal chain of determinism. And Bob Kane has objected in the following uh, sense. He says the agent doesn't have complete control over what chance images and other thoughts enter his mind or influence his deliberation. They simply come as they please. Those are William James' words. They present themselves. They just pop into our heads, and he's got it quite right. But that's the problem, because what happens from then on, how the agent reacts, is determined, he says, by desires and beliefs he already has. This is Bob's latest book on uh, covering the field, a wonderful introduction to the subject. But I want to say to Bob, the determination by reasons, by our values, by our character, by our desires, is not predeterminism. So what's to worry about? if we, in fact, do what we wanted our brains and, and self to do. So libertarianism need not require that the will itself be free, in the sense of quantumly random, and in undetermined by reasons. Now, Al has basically written a good deal about what he calls the problem of luck, which is similar to what Bob Kane is saying. If these things pop into our head at random, how can we claim responsibility for the brilliant work in, in entanglement that Nikola has done? It just happened to you. You know, you had nothing to do with it in this theory. So, uh, but what Al says is, when luck, good or bad, is problematic, that is because it seems significantly to impede agents' control over themselves. And this is the classic criticism of the chance component in the two-stage model. If it's chance, hey, you don't get credit. Now, my reply is, look, luck is real in the world. It's part of the universe, the randomness. But as long as our evaluation and selection of options are adequately determined, my term, my qualifier, by our reasons, values, etc., we are responsible, however the options were generated. Now, Heisenberg's objection. Well, actually, as you heard him say yesterday, he really doesn't have any objections to my two-stage model because he thought of it himself, as did, as did 10 other thinkers. So the question is, of the five living important people who've written on this, three in this room, 
Heisenberg agreeing, and Dennett, I'm hoping to get converted as well. Can we actually make progress in philosophy the way we like to do in science?